One of the most challenging parts of concurrent programming is how to deal with shared mutable state. And when it comes to Kotlin's coroutines, we've got several options to help us manage that state. So let's see what those options are and when we might want to use each one. Here's some code for a bakery that prepares cakes, pies, and cupcakes, and each one costs a different amount. We've got one baker, it's a coroutine, who's preparing 100,000 orders. Now the orders that are placed are random, but you can see I'm using a seed here so that we get the same values every time, and that way our inputs will be predictable. When our baker is done with all that baking, we print out the total revenue for the day, and when we run this as it is, we'll get exactly $1 million of revenue. So this works just fine with a single baker, but what happens when we split up the 100,000 baked goods among two different bakers so that each of them bakes half of the orders? Well, in that case, when we run the code, we'll often end up with a number that's much lower than $1 million. And this is a simple example of shared mutable state and the race condition that we run into when we don't deal with it properly. So let's look at the tools that Kotlin gives us to prevent race conditions. In this solution, I'm using Atomics, which were introduced in Kotlin 2.1. They're still experimental, but they can really work well for keeping track of simple values like a running total. To use Atomics, we just wrap our integer value with an atomic type like this, atomic int, and most of the rest of the code can stay exactly as it was. Now we can make the atomic variable itself a val, whereas previously we had a mutable var, and updates can still look like they did before. Atomic integers support this plus assign operator, we just need the right import up here. The only other thing that I needed to update was down here, when reading the total we need to call dot load to get the underlying integer value. But let's run this just to make sure that we get $1 million of revenue, and we're good. Besides atomic integer, there are atomics for longs, booleans, arrays, and references, so this is a great choice, especially for updating simple values. Another option, one that's similar to atomics, is state flow. Now, since this one's a flow, I would normally tend to prefer this in situations where you're actually going to collect all of the values, like in a Compose app, for example. Stateflow has a few functions that provide atomic updates, including update and get, get an update, and update. You can see here I'm just using the update function, and inside the lambda here, the parameter it refers to the current value. And then down here when we're done, I just read the current value by calling the value property. In this example code, I would actually prefer an atomic because we don't have any need to collect the values from a flow, but if you already need a flow anyway, state flow is going to be a very natural choice. Next, let's look at a very classic approach to managing shared state, and it's called a mutex, or mutual exclusion. In Kotlin, we can create a mutex with a call to its factory function, like I'm doing here. Then once we've got it, we just find the part of our code that updates the shared state, sometimes we call that the critical section, and we wrap it in a call to mutex.withlock, like I'm doing here and here. The mutex allows only one caller at a time into the block of code. So if this first coroutine already has the lock, then when the second coroutine calls with lock, it's going to suspend right here, waiting for the first coroutine to release it. I'll just run this just to show that it works. And there we go, $1 million. And by the way, mutex objects have a lock and unlock function as well, and you can call those directly, but it's easy to forget to unlock them when you're done. So when possible, I usually prefer calling with lock instead so that it automatically unlocks the mutex when the block is done, even if an exception is thrown. But if you've got a complex critical section where you need to lock a mutex in one function and unlock it in another, that's the kind of situation where the lock and unlock functions are most helpful. Another approach that many Kotlin developers like is called confinement. As long as all of the updates to the data happen on a single thread or on a single coroutine, there's no risk of a race condition because a thread or a coroutine can only do one thing at a time. So one way to achieve this is to create a dispatcher that has a thread pool with just a single thread in it. But the more preferred approach is to use a dispatcher with limited parallelism using a size of one. Now, technically, this doesn't guarantee that the dispatcher will always use the same thread, but it does guarantee that only one thing will run 
on that dispatcher at a time. So we just wrap our critical section with a context change like I'm doing here and here. And structurally, this looks very similar to what we had last time with the mutex. But instead of a mutex, we've got a dispatcher. And instead of calling with lock, we call with context. So it can have a very similar footprint to using a mutex if you're using with lock. Now, if you use confinement like this, just try to make it clear why you're changing dispatchers. I tend to name my single parallelism dispatchers synchronized in order to communicate its purpose at the call sites. Another approach to consider for managing shared mutable state is the actor API. Now, I'll warn you that the current implementation of actors is marked as obsolete, so you'll have to opt into this using the obsolete coroutines API annotation like I'm doing here. Despite being obsolete for quite a while, some developers really like them, and I haven't seen any movement on an updated implementation. Their current implementation might stick around for a while longer yet. To use an actor, we call this actor function and store the state within its lambda. Since this is a lambda body, this amount variable isn't accessible outside of the actor. So in other words, amount isn't a property, it's just a variable inside a lambda. So we don't mark it as private, but still it's not accessible anywhere but inside this lambda. Actors rely on message passing to change their state. So here I created these message types to increase the total and another to uh, print out the total. Each actor runs on its own coroutine, and since each coroutine can only do one thing at a time, any update to its state will be synchronized naturally. And down here I send the message to increase the total amount, and then down here I send another message to print out the total. And when we're all done, we got to remember to call close. Uh, as you'll recall with structured concurrency, parent coroutines are not going to finish until all of their children complete. And since this actor creates a coroutine that's the child of run blocking, that means that the run blocking coroutine won't finish until the actor's coroutine finishes. So we got to call close to finish the actor coroutine. Some developers really like actors, but they do require a bit more code with all of the message types, the message loops, the extra coroutine that's created. So I tend to only reach for actors when I'm already using channels for workflows where it would fit in a little more naturally. And finally, if it's possible to avoid shared mutable state, that's usually the best choice. Here is the same code, but structured in a way that avoids the shared state entirely. So rather than each coroutine updating a shared variable, each one simply adds up the total for its own items. And since these coroutines are created with the async builder, we can call await on each of them down here at the end, where we just add them together to get the grand total. So when we run this, we'll get exactly $1 million of revenue, which is what we were hoping for. This approach is great for situations like this where the program is simply computing a value, but when you need to track user data that changes over time in a long running app, you'll need one of the other techniques that we already looked at. So there you have it. We've got several ways that we can deal with shared mutable state when we're working with coroutines in Kotlin. If you can avoid the shared state altogether, that's usually your best option. And when that's not possible, I tend to go with the simplest option that works. So for basic types like numbers, Atomics can be a great fit. If my app needs to react to state changes as they occur, state flow is going to be an obvious choice. For more complex updates, I'm fine with either mutexes or limited parallelism. And as I mentioned, I'm not really a big fan of actors, but some developers love them. If you'd like to keep up with everything I'm doing, you can join tons of other Kotlin developers who've signed up for my email newsletter. And in my next email, I'm planning to include a quick reference PDF about the shared mutable state techniques that we looked at today. So if you haven't already joined, just head over to newsletter.typealias.com. And hey, if you subscribe to this channel and like this video, you'll make my day. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.